And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is Friday. Thank you, Greta. We are happy to be here once again with episode 61 of Climate Change Roundtable. This one, we're going to talk about President Biden and his new plans, um, Biden versus the people. Uh, we're also going to be talking about how that's going to affect us as, in terms of having reliable and affordable power. Because, you know, just about any time the government gets involved in anything, it gets less efficient and more expensive. Today is our usual panel of suspects. We've got with us Linnea Lucan and Sterling Burnett, who will be joining us to talk about these topics and to also talk about the, what the Americans think. Now, we have an interesting set of numbers from the Pew Poll group that we'll be talking about after we talk about the whole carbon capture thing going on with power plants that Biden is proposing. I want to give you just a quick little background about carbon, what they call carbon capture, which is improperly named. It's actually carbon dioxide sequestration. And basically, it's like this. The idea is you've got a power plant that's producing carbon dioxide, and so we're going to capture and separate the carbon dioxide out of the smokestack and shove it into the ground, basically. We're going to take that CO2 and put it into a geological formation, depleted oil and gas reserves, the water table in the deep aquifer, which I think is hugely dangerous, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then, you know, it just, the idea is we're going to take all of the carbon dioxide and shove it into the ground. Now, this has never been done successfully on a large scale. But of course, you know, the bureaucrats of the Biden administration think they can just snap their fingers and technology will magically happen, right? Anyway, so with us today, both these guys that are usually talking about these things, uh, you know, I want to bring up Sterling first, because Sterling, you have some interesting comments on this idea. But oh, before we get to that, I want to get to some of the news articles that we've been seeing about this. First is Town Hall. The Town Hall ran an article basically saying this whole deal might be illegal. Could very well be. Um, you know, they're thinking maybe uh, it's just that whole snap of the fingers thing is just illegal. But they can't really force companies to do this. Uh, we'll see about that. And then we have another one from Politico that's basically saying that the newest big climate rule will, will rely on rarely used technology. Like I said before, nobody has done this at scale. Nobody has done this successfully, even in a small scale. All of the small scale tests have either failed or closed. And yet somehow Biden is going to ramrod this for us. And then finally, you know, Vox said this could be a trillion dollar business. Ooh, money, 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 money. They're after that. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing right there. All right. So, Sterling, you had an interesting comment about all this. Let's see what you have to say. Well, some of the issues you raised are also very interesting. Um, look, it, the reason it's likely illegal is because uh, the Supreme Court ruled in, in West Virginia v. EPA uh, that this is a major question, that forcing power plants to adopt particular technologies or uh or, or else close down, but which this, they'll effectively do is close them down, uh, is a major question that must be addressed by Congress. It can't be done by executive agency, by, legis by fiat. Uh, that's what the court has ruled. And uh, Biden uh, got some provisions in the uh, <laughs> Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, right. He got some changes in there that they think will allow them to skirt the Supreme Court ruling. I don't think it will, um, because 
it still doesn't address CO2 and power plants directly. And so uh, it's, it's likely illegal, but more importantly, it's, it's dangerous. Look, if we want to power a, 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 an electric grid that works, we have to have base load power and peaking power, and they have to be traditional power sources. That's just a fact. Wind and solar and battery backup can't replace that yet at scale at all. And right. um, so they say, well, we got to, we've got these technologies, carbon capture, which as you said, is, is really carbon dioxide sequestration. First, there isn't enough impermeable permanent places to store all the carbon dioxide emitted in a single year, much less over decades underground. Uh, so it won't leak back out. It, it doesn't exist. We don't have that capacity. They've, they've done studies of it. We don't have the capacity. So where do they think they're going to store it? Don't know. Does the technology work? Not any place it's been tested so far, including a coal fire power plant. I believe it was in Arkansas with a test case. And the technology repeatedly failed. It broke and it broke and it broke. And it adds so much to the cost that the only option will actually be closing down the power plants themselves, which, of course, is what Biden really wants. So, Linnea, you've been involved in drilling um, and, you know, as, as a petroleum engineer. What do you think about the, the, the practicality of time? drilling into the ground and shoving CO2 down there. Well, I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't know what the exact mechanism is that they're doing that. I can't imagine that, you know, kind of like with the fracking arguments where they say, um, if you're pumping these fluids down into a reservoir, then they can come up and poison things. If you're deep enough, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and carbon dioxide isn't, you know, you have an example later to show how it could be dangerous, but it isn't normally super dangerous unless it's a high concentration in an enclosed area. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of questionable, questioning it, but uh, I don't know enough about the technology yet. And I don't, I don't know that very many people do um, to make a really definitive statement on it. But I will say the oil industry really likes this because it gives them the opportunity to um, basically get paid to do this. And also um, they uh, they get to kind of ask to be eaten last, I guess, if they <laughs> if they take on some of these projects. So they don't really mind it all that much. Uh, they like to do these kinds of big projects and investment and everything. So um, I've seen a lot of very pro carbon capture and storage uh, rhetoric from even oil and gas industry and um, representatives who are vocal about how they don't think that there's a climate catastrophe, but they're still pro carbon capture and storage. And um, I'm sure that it, it works out somewhere or another for them, but forcing it by mandate is obviously not <laughs> going to help anyone because, you know, the, smaller companies and the smaller power plants or more local power plants might not be able to so easily afford it without passing these costs off to the consumers. Um, and it's an expensive kind of a project. It's not um, just some little, it's not like just installing some scrubbers or something, which are on their own quite expensive, but uh, this is a whole nother issue. Let's, you know, Linnea brings up a really good point is that, uh, it's not just oil and gas that likes this technology. Of course, it's coal that likes this technology, right? They think if um, they're going to get government dollars, they're going to get big bucks to try and install this technology. Uh, in fact, the largest, you know, everyone always talks about, oh, fossil fuels get huge subsidies. Fossil fuels, we know they don't. But one place where they've been getting subsidies for a few years now is carbon capture and storage. So... Uh, the oil industry has been using this for a long time, though it hasn't been storage. It's just been capture. They pump it into old wells uh, to increase production. But that doesn't make it permanent. This is a whole different ball game because this stuff is not supposed to come back out. Once it's in the ground, it's supposed to stay there forever. Um, and we just don't have those kind of impermeable reservoirs sufficient to store billions of tons of carbon dioxide a year. It doesn't exist, folks. So this is a, a this is a 
they'll get some subsidies. They'll get some big bucks to try and to try and get this. The industries, even the fossil fuel industries, support this because they're going to get some money. Uh, but in the end, it won't save their industry. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the bottom line. In the end, natural gas plants won't be able to store all their carbon. Coal plants won't be able to store all their carbon, which is likely the demand in the EPA's rule. And uh, they'll go out of business and we'll be left with ephemeral wind and solar with battery backup, some hydro, which is declining because we're tearing out dams, and nuclear, which is declining because despite all the investment in new plants, we're not building new plants, but we're closing old plants. So uh, the, the, the grid becomes increasingly fragile. Yeah, Sterling, you bring up a good point about we don't have enough reservoirs available to store all this stuff. I mean, we really don't, not just in the United States, but also globally. These kind of structures are fairly rare. And here's the thing. You really don't know what's underground. If you're going to shove CO2 underground and you think it's got this you know, shape or capacity or whatever, I mean, it's really somewhat of a crapshoot. It's just like drilling for oil. You think it's down there. Maybe you hit it. Maybe you don't. That's the problem. And so if you start shoving CO2 underground in this uh, sequestration scheme, you run the risk of not knowing what you're shoving it into. You may put it into an unstable environment. One of the things I really worry about is when they're talking about the deep aquifer here on this graphic, shoving it down into a water table and basically making carbonated soda water beneath the ground. So one of the most frightening things about CO2 underground was illustrated in something called the Lake Nyos disaster. And the Lake Nyos disaster, which happened in Cameroon a few years ago, um, was catastrophic. It killed a bunch of people because there was this lake that had natural CO2 bubbling up underneath it. And because of the pressure of the water, it kept that CO2 under pressure, just like what happens inside of a soda pop bottle. What happened, though, is that there was an earthquake and it shook it. And you all know what happens if you take a soda pop bottle and shake it especially if it's warm, like it is in Africa. Well, that's exactly what happened here. They sh that water got shaken up by an earthquake, and the carbon dioxide came spewing out, just like you taking the cap off of a, a soda bottle uh, that's warm and been shaken up in the summertime. And so all the CO2 flowed out across the land, and it killed people. It killed livestock. It was a huge disaster. So who's to say that something like this with carbon dioxide sequestration couldn't happen. We just don't know. That's a real danger that I don't think they're considering. Comments? Well, it, it, that's a danger for humans. But even, let's say, for, for the sake of argument, that we can store all this stuff underground, right? And, it, and it's impermeable, that it's not going to eventually rise back out. Um, there are underground ecosystems. Uh, you know, look, there are species in 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 underground uh, areas that supposedly uh, many of them protected by the Endangered Species Act and things like that, that we're not just supposed to be killing willy nilly. Are they going to go under there and do a survey of everything like uh, oil and gas industry is supposed to do where they have to do a, a NEPA proposal for each storage facility, storage area uh, to show that it won't harm the environment? Uh, or is it are are they going to be rushed through like these wind and solar and offshore wind plants are? If they're if they do a you know a thorough NEPA, uh, they're going to have to do some weird research underground to make sure it's not causing environmental problems. Or environmentalists, you know what's going to happen is environmentalists are going to sue to say the NEPAs aren't adequate. They'll say, oh, you you didn't do an adequate you know survey of the underground facility you're going to store it in. Uh, it could kill species. It could leak back out. You got to do a better survey, and they'll tie these up for years. Of course, they don't. They 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 want this to fail. Once again, it's not about saving the industry by giving them an out. Uh, it's not about saving coal by giving it an out. It's not about saving oil and gas by giving it an out with through carbon capture and storage. It's about shutting them down because it doesn't work. Well, and that's a good point, Sterling. Um, even if they could capture every ounce 
of, cli- of uh, carbon dioxide that's emitted from oil and gas operations, from your tailpipe, from everything, even if they could do all of that, they would still try to stop us from using fossil fuels. Because in the end, it's not about reducing carbon dioxide emissions. It's about control. And we've gone over that. I mean, because all we do is we export our emissions at this point and we pretend like it's fine. And some environmentalists know this and they and they talk about it. They say um, that this, for example, cap and trade um, is like nonsense. It's it's emissions money laundering. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> you know, it's it's not it's not actually reducing emissions in any substantial way. It's just, you know, major banks and stuff are able to kind of shuffle it around a little bit and keep, you know, uh, as they say, um, what do they call it? Uh, continuing on as normal. Um, so business as usual, yeah. yeah, business as usual is what I was looking right. for. Thank you. I'm just garbage brain today. Um, so the, uh, so it, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I do think though that it's stupid, so I don't know why we're doing it. But if you if they're putting carbon dioxide, if they're finding old, depleted, um, like traditional, um, you know, salt dome traps and that kind of thing, like the strategic reserve is under, uh, that might work. But you need a whole lot of those, I imagine. Probably, as Anthony said, we don't have enough to do all of it. Um, so in the end, this is probably a waste of time but everyone's yeah. getting kickbacks about it so everyone's pretty enthusiastic about it well there's you know, know. There, maybe maybe there's your solution uh, biden has already drained the strategic petroleum reserve so much we're down to less than 50 percent. <laughs> maybe he'll just drain the rest of it and we can use that for to, to store all the carbon dioxide well, now, right? I, I saw someone um make a comment that you know, what about methane capture and, yeah. and use? And that's great. We do that all the time, do that, you know, yeah. from landfills and everything. That's useful. Um, you can use, yeah. use captured methane to make I plastics, think, to heat things, whatever. With yeah. waste management runs their trucks, I think, on landfill methane gas. Um, so it's, there's nothing wrong with that. They're actively using it. If there are things that we, we can actively use CO2 besides, and I, there could be uses that I'm just not aware of. Um, I know, you know, other than making mixed gas for scuba diving and stuff, um, I'm sure, I don't know, it depends on the depth, I suppose, but uh, that gets a little bit complicated. I'm not aware of uses of pure carbon dioxide outside of, other than greenhouses, but. uh, Well, we use it. I think, you know, look, we, we, I don't, maybe it's not pure. I don't know, but we use it in carbonated beverages, but that doesn't right. store it because yeah, as, but soon that's we not, open, yeah, as soon as we store, right open the beverage, it's back in the air. We use it in CO2 pellets for pellet guns and other uses like that. Um, but once again, it's released back in the atmosphere. There, there, you can't use it if you have to lock it away and it can never be leaked out. Are they, are they, are they, separating out like are they storing co2 or are they storing the carbon after burning off the oxygen no the the the, the theory is they're storing that that they've got to be storing the carbon dioxide oh, right it's, it's not yeah, it's not it's not black carbon worse. it's not it's not soot it, it, it's it's carbon dioxide that you've got to be and that's you know <laughs> yeah that's a if whole, they, whole different ball game if they were taking carbon black and shoving it under the ground it would be a whole different ball game, you know. It's just like putting coal back on the ground, so to speak, almost. But they're not doing that. They're trying to put the carbon dioxide directly from the smokestacks out of the power plant in a gaseous form straight into the ground under pressure. And from my perspective, that's dangerous, it's unknown, and it's risky. Uh, well, someone's making money on it. <laughs> But yeah, oh, well, you know that emissions money laundering term you came up with, Linnea, that's yeah. a good one. That is a very good term because it's actually true. I mean, literally, they're going to throw a boatload of money at this. They're not going to accomplish much of anything. And 
it's just going to pay for a bunch of people doing a bunch of stuff that they think is, you know, virtue signaling and making things better and green for the planet, you know, trillions of dollars in there. It's just like the bullet train going on in California. That thing is nothing but a money laundering scheme as far as it goes for the cronies of the government and the contractors and so forth. It's not getting anywhere. It's not going anywhere. It's not happening anytime soon. It's four times over a budget now. It is a complete train wreck, literally. But, and you know, this. And, and it's, it's supposed to be a high speed train and it's not going anywhere fast. Yeah, it is going nowhere fast. I, but, uh, I got to say this, the, the, uh, the comment chain where they were talking about the, uh, the non-binary CO2, how, how to solve the, the <laughs> problem. I'm just loving it. Uh, I, I'm just loving it. It's like, yeah, it's just CO2 start identifying as something else. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe they can identify as a rare earth mineral. And, uh, so they can be useful for, uh, for the EV batteries and the, uh, wind and solar and magnets and batteries and things. Right. The problem that we've got in general with these folks that are mandating this stuff is that they are not engineers. They have not been able to figure this stuff out in a way that's actually going to work. They just simply think we're going to snap our fingers, make a law and boom, it's going to happen. Technology does not work that way. It's never worked that way. It can't work that way. And yet they are just simply thinking they can mandate technology to happen and mandate it to be successful. It just, it's a complete folly. Well, they have they do that all the time, especially with regards to uh, climate change. I mean, if they really believed, and I've said this for a long time, if they really believed that just, because this is what you hear politicians saying, well, we have ingenuity and American know-how. And, you know, as soon as it's the law, uh, entrepreneurs in the market will figure out how to do it. Well, if entrepreneurs uh, need, need to do it, it would they would have been responding to market forces. Uh, and and doing it already, um, if if just simply passing a law was sufficient, they wouldn't have to throw lots of subsidized money at it. Right. Uh, if if they really believed passing a law was sufficient to get anything they want done, I don't understand why. Twenty or thirty years ago, they didn't say uh, we have we've outlawed cancer. Cancer will be no more by twenty twenty. <laughs> we passed the law. Now get to it. And researchers know that if you don't do it, you're out of business. We send you no more yeah. money. We we uh, we cut you off. We throw you in jail because you failed to obey the law and solve the problem of cancer. Now they don't do that. Why? Because passing a law, they know passing a law can't solve that. But somehow they think this is just an engineering problem, and it's not. It's a basic physics problem, and physics doesn't change. Yep. Physics is like a honey badger. Physics don't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly That's right. That's right. So anyway, we've got another topic here. Now, in the middle of all of this, you know, the Biden administration is pushing this idea, which is probably completely never going to work and com maybe completely illegal. They're pushing this. They don't seem to give a whit about what Americans are thinking. And um, Americans attitudes on climate change are starting to change. There is a Pew poll that came out just a little while ago in April. It says 54% of Americans view climate change as a major threat, but a partisan divide has grown. We know about this growing partisan divide, but what's most interesting to me is that the um, in the Democratic side or the lean Democratic side, it peaked at 84% and it's now on its way down. In fact, all U.S. adults, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, independents, or whatever, it's down. So basically what's happening here is that the messaging that's going on saying climate change is a crisis, climate change is a crisis, we must do something, isn't making any more headway. It seems, to, you know, there's there's been peak oil. Well, I think we've reached peak climate as far as the opinion of people goes because people like Greta Thunberg and so forth and Al Gore out there making these ridiculous ridiculous, impossible, idiotic statements are not resonating with the public. The public's smarter than they think, I believe. And that's why these numbers are starting to go down. How dare you? Yeah. You, you know, Pew tried to make the case that a partisan divide has grown, but I, I, I don't see it. It was 30% in 2020 for Republicans and 83% 
So 53 points difference. Now it's down to 78 in Democrats and 23. The partisan divide hadn't grown that much. The uh, the divide between Democrats and independents and Republicans hasn't grown that much. What's grown is the decline in belief of climate change as a major issue. Uh, it is for Democrats. It barely is for independents. And it's not at all for Republicans. And a more recent poll confirms that. Uh, the AP uh, University of Chicago poll. It, this is interesting. You know, look, they, they take these polls every year. And uh, while concern about climate change is generally pretty high, um, look at that. Since 2018, uh, adults who believe climate change is happening and is caused mostly by humans among Democrats has fallen from 72 percent to 60 percent. Yeah, that's among huge. independents. It's it's fallen to 42 percent. So it's underwater among Republicans. I mean, among independents and for Republicans. It hasn't moved at all. So all the propaganda, all the drip, drip, drip daily of news stories telling you humans are causing dangerous climate change. It's killing the planet. It's an existential threat. We hear it all the time. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not moving the needle. If it's moving the needle at all, it's not moving it in the direction they want it to move. The concern about human-caused climate change is going down not just among Republicans, not just among independents, but even among Democrats. Yeah, and, you know, it's. I think that's why we're seeing so much desperation and vitriol in the news lately, because the Democrats and the left, they know that they're losing in this. They're, they're losing the minds of people uh, about climate change being a crisis. People are just not buying it like they used to. And so the needle's going down, and... They're, they're panicked. Now, earlier in 2023, in January, January 18 to 24, uh, there was another Pew poll that says, what's the top priority? What They ask Americans, what's the top priority? Well, strengthening the economy came out overwhelmingly, and number one at 75%. And then there was health care costs, terrorism, political influence, and, and money, and so forth and so on. Uh, but look, we're dealing with climate changes down near the bottom. So what's happening is, is that the Biden administration is not paying attention to this. And like I said, the left is panicked about this. Just, they just keep thinking if we can just push harder, we can convince people of the danger of climate change. But people are realizing that there's no danger at all. The word or the phrase climate crisis is just a made up term. It was to put onto the, into the uh, lexicon just a few years ago. It didn't exist before that. And it's a marketing tool. It's a marketing tool to push the idea that we have to do something now and doing something now involves more government control and more government mandates and all kinds of other things that are not conducive to a modern society and a free market society. And that's what we're ending up with when we see the stuff from Biden. Guys, what do you think? Well, I think if we just think for a second about how bizarre it is that a scientific subject like this is starkly divided on on party line. You know, if you did a poll like this and you said, um, you know, percentage of people who think that we need to address cancer, I think the parties would be pretty well together on it, right? So the fact that the climate change thing is so far apart just shows how, you know, from their perspective, how awful of a job the alarmists have done at making this out to be a scientific issue. Um, it's It's you know, demonstrably not at this point. Uh, it is, yeah. it's highly partisan and it shouldn't be. I mean, we should, you should be able to talk to people about this without them getting uh, like politically sensitive about it. Um, and it's a shame that it is like this uh, because I think that if it was a little bit um, less partisan, then more people would be able to get themselves to listen to all the different perspectives, all the different theories, and they would be interested in it as a science, the way that they are about other subjects. Um, but as long as the left grips so tight onto these ideas that they have, that it needs to be some like sweeping universal 
uh, like socialistic <laughs> um, methods to solve it are the only way to go forward. Uh, it's it's never going to like seriously be debated as a scientific topic. You know, if they did a poll just on scientific topics, I wonder where climate change would rank uh, with other scientific uh, concerns. This is a political poll, right? Uh, it, it's asking what it actually asked was what it actually asked was. Um, what do you think should be the top priorities for the president and Congress in the coming year? Now, Pew asked this poll, asked the same question year after year after year. They add different categories of of um, of uh, issues like this one has. I, I, if you, if it can be blown up, it's it asks something about like parents struggling with children. You look <laughs> that just goes that just goes to show me. Um, that uh, people don't think it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, <laughs> they think it takes parents uh, and the government shouldn't be involved. But uh, climate change, and th th this is not a one-off poll. Year after year, multiple polls from different organizations all show the same thing. When asked, do you think climate change is important? People almost uniformly say, yep. Just like they say that when you ask them about crime or healthcare, or in isolation, all of them are important. Oh, we really care. Do you care? Somewhat are very, very much concerned about climate change. But when asked to rank it in relation to other issues that, you know, we, we live in a world of limited resources, limited attention, limited ability to Congress to act. When asked to rank it in relation to all those other issues, whether it's healthcare, the economy, whatever, none of which I know of have ever been called an existential crisis, uh, but climate change has. Climate change ranks last or near last in every poll. It never ranks near the top. It's almost always last. And I think that they added weird categories like uh, dealing with the challenges facing parents, uh, you know, which, which had not been on the poll before, just to make it rise. But still, out of 21 categories, it came in 17th. The existential threat, the, the thing that John Kerry and Joe Biden and his administration and members of Congress say is the most important issue facing the world today, the public does not agree. Uh, they don't believe it's the most important issue. And more importantly, one thing they do agree on, they don't want to pay much to fight it. Yes, that's true. Uh, we had a great comment from Jim Lakely. I want to show you. Uh, if not for the endless and inescapable alarmist propaganda, climate change would right below invasion by Canada in the worries of Americans. <laughs> I, I, I think that's probably one of the strongest truths ever. Seriously, I mean, who's worried about invasion by Canada? It's, it's like some people are worried about climate change, but people that are in the know who actually, you know, follow the science... We're not worried about it. We've done so well as humans over the past millennia, you know, in, in adapting to change. It's easy enough for us to adapt to, you know, a degree or two of temperature change. And we're doing it successfully. I mean, there are less, less deaths now due to severe weather, less deaths due to heat, less deaths all around. We're adapting. We're successful. We're living in a golden age. And yet the left would have you think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and carbon dioxide is the reason. And they can't get that out of their heads. You know what's interesting? Um, I, uh, I just saw this morning a study has been published uh, that, said, that indicates. So maybe maybe the alarmists have actually helped us on this. Um, by talking about science and science and science and people starting to examine what science says. Because what the study says is that the more people become educated about the climate and science, the less concerned they are, that, that, that they don't think there's a crisis in the offing, and that it only rises in concern for people who don't examine science, that, that if they just get headlines, they're concerned. But as they learn more about the actual science, they're less concerned. That, that's uh, that's the opposite of what alarmists think should be happening, since they think they own the science. Well, they that, speak for the science. Well, that's sterling, but also they 
frequently, and I think we've covered this before, not on this show, but maybe in climate realism, they've covered that they are fully aware that the, uh, when people start digging in and looking at um, the, that's why the consensus idea exists, right? They're trying to claim that there is a, con don't look at the man behind the curtain. Right. Don't look at any of the extra data that's out there that throws some of this theory into question yeah. because once people do, then they're not as worried about it anymore because they see that there are people who are legitimate scientists who are excellent in their fields who say, eh, you know, it's probably happening. You know, we have uh, climatologists and meteorologists who are on Twitter, for example, who will say things like, I think it's probably likely that human emissions are contributing to a degree, but it's not enough for us to overthrow society and give up all of our freedoms and stuff when we can just work on adaptation because there are some benefits from global warming, um, you know, alongside some of the possible detrimental changes um, on the long scale. So being able to have all of the information and balance it is how people get over being afraid of something. Right. That's why. You know, that's why it, the and it, I think Margaret Thatcher said it best. She said this back in the 80s. Or the prime minister of England, Margaret Thatcher, said that global warming is a perfect excuse to push socialism. And that's what we're seeing here in the way that they're pushing these mandates down our throats. And her advisor, of course, was on, on climate change with Lord Moncton. So uh, right. one, of our, one of our good friends and allies. You know, I think uh, Linnea put her finger on the pulse because one of the things that's interesting, you know, the evidence, the, the, you've got all these scientists who are quietly saying, yeah, it's happening. Humans are probably responsible for some of it, but it's not a disaster. There's a reason why when they write, when the IPCC produces its reports, politicians get involved in approving or not approving the executive summaries. They don't write the reports, but they do approve and write the executive summaries. They've got that red, red marker. And when it comes to doubt or uh, you know, uncertainty, that goes out the window. They just use the red mark. No, we can't say that. We need to phrase it stronger. And it does. So the executive summaries rarely reflect the science that is done. The uncertainty, the, uh, the uh, lack of uh, consensus, you know, whatever you want to say about any, any particular thing in the scientific document, the Science, the summary, executive summary, which is written by the politicians, um, doesn't reflect that. A and yet, of course, the executive summary is all that the press ever reports on. So we've been talking about the economics uh, and sensibilities, all these things related to this, you know, carbon sequestration idea and the impracticality of it. But let's get down to what Americans really think again. You know, one of the things that, that, the Biden administration and lots of different administrations has talked about is putting out a carbon fee to fund these projects. And here again, the public simply doesn't want to go that way. Less than half of Americans are supportive of a monthly carbon fee, probably because they know that if they send money to the government for anything, the government's going to waste it, just like they do with things like the bullet train and so forth. Uh, because faith in government, and it's particularly faith in the ability for government to spend money effectively and accurately, is basically out the window. That's gone with you know, gone with everything. Um, yeah. And why should you pay money? Look at that. It says fewer than half of Americans. Fewer than half makes it sound like it'd be forty nine percent or forty eight percent. No, six sixty uh, two percent of Americans w aren't even willing to pay a single dollar a month in carbon fee to fight climate change. 62% of Americans. If you raise it to $10 a month, 69% of Americans. $20 a month, well, 71% uh, of Americans. The, the point is, they're willing to spend almost nothing to fight climate change. And this, once again, is one of those things that has been consistent across polls over time. Uh, it can be phrased in different ways. Uh, now, it's interesting that there is 21% of Americans that say they would pay $100 a month carbon fee. I looked into it. It turns out that about 20% of Americans 
earn over $150,000 a year. I will wager that 95% of the people who said that were the people that were earning over $150,000 a year. I don't think Probably. someone who's earning $30,000 is saying, yeah, let's take uh, let's take $100 a month out of my budget to fight climate change. He's, he's in the $1 category. Um, yeah, well, it just goes back to saying that the climate change issue has always been in the purview of the wealthy. The people, yeah, the people, with, the people with the beachfront homes, multi-million dollar beachfront homes are willing to pay a lot to prevent their homes from being flooded uh, if they really believe that's what's going on. But this, like I said, this is one of those things that year after year, back in 2019, a poll uh, by, the, um, I think it was Kaiser Family Foundation and the Washington Post, um, it showed that a majority, I think it was 60 percent of those polled said they thought climate change was happening and would cause damage to people, identifiable harms in 10 years, with more than half of those saying it would be in less than two years. So that time's already passed. And yet, 51% uh, of them would not be willing to pay uh, um, $10 a month more for their electricity to fight climate change. Uh, something like, uh, I forget the percentage would not be able to pay, be willing to pay 10 cents a gallon more for gasoline to fight climate change. Uh, and as the, you know, as the numbers went up, the, the number of people who supported it go way down when you break it down. It's crazy that even among people who think climate change is happening, it could be really bad. They aren't willing to pay much to fight it, which tells me there's either some cognitive dissonance going on. Uh, or they don't really think that climate change is going to, you know, be causing damage to their health and their property and stuff in the short term, uh, in any foreseeable future, because, it, you know, look, I'm willing to pay to protect my home from damage, to, from theft. I do, you know, people who are really concerned about something take steps to, uh, to fight it. If you're concerned about cancer, you go to the doctor, even though it's expensive. Um, yeah but they're not willing to pay for climate change. And that's not unique to this poll. That is poll after poll after poll. So what they do, uh, what the environmentalists and the other pollers do and the pollers do is they say, Oh, but how do you feel about electric vehicles or how do you feel about wind and solar? Oh yeah. I like that. What they don't tell you is that electric vehicles will add more than $10 a month to your, to your driving bill. And uh, wind and solar will add a lot more than $20 a month to your electricity bill, which you said you wouldn't be willing to pay. What they say is wind and solar are cheaper than coal. Wind and solar are cheaper than other sources of energy. So how do you feel about that? Oh yeah, support that. Uh, and, and so they lie to get you to support things that in isolation, if you knew how much they cost, you wouldn't support. Yeah. yeah. I would like to see a Venn diagram of people who mm. are true believers, who are not necessarily politically driven and people who would take any position to get their policies passed. Because I have a feeling that there's quite a few, there's a decent amount of overlap there, but there are quite a few people who are very cynically using the climate change issue to just push, because it's popular, right? And it's in the media a lot, to just push their wish list of progressive policies. And every, because you notice every single, the solution to every, you know, major world problem is mm -hmm. some kind of a progressive policy checklist. It's always the same handful of policies and there's just no way that they uniformly fix every ailment that the planet faces, you know. Uh, so it's, it, it's pretty sad. Yeah, I wonder if they'd ask a question on the poll. Even if climate change isn't a threat, would you still support, uh, you know, whatever action, uh, wind turbines or or uh, resetting capitalism, uh, stopping uh, private interest from interfering with uh, government actions to, you know, whatever. That would be interesting. You never see that, Paul. Yeah, I think a Venn diagram would be great. Yeah, I wonder if there's enough data available out there that we could actually construct one. <laughs> Oh, boy. So, Adding more projects <laughs> to the list. <laughs> All righty. So here's another interesting thing. Here's a, a part of the, the same poll 
Um, comparing Democrats and Republicans on overall, the incentivizing the purchase of electric vehicles draws more support than placing stricter fuel standards or prohibiting the sale of gas vehicles. As you, you've probably heard, California has passed a law that you can't sell any more gasoline powered vehicles past 2035. And then just today I found out by 2030, they're going to phase out locomotives that are being run on diesel that are more than 20 years old. And then you got to go to the electric locomotives and all this other craziness. And again, it's politicians mandating engineering without thinking of the consequences. And so it's, it's going to be pretty rough. But what's most interesting about this is that um, it, it shows that there's a clear division between Democrats and Republicans, but it also shows that people really don't want these mandates uh, that are coming down from the government. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I got out of California, because it literally it's like a mandate a day. They are not ruling by democracy anymore. They're ruling by bureaucracy. Yeah, uh, this this is interesting because... Um... It's in, in a lot of the Biden administration's rule that basically his new uh, efficiency standards and, and uh, car emission standards rule, which will phase out uh, six, more than 60 percent of the vehicles sold today, um, I think by 2030 or certainly by 2035, I forget, um, your, for, your F-150 won't be on the road. Now, now Ford has recently pulled its uh, electric truck off <laughs> Of production um, after some fires started in uh, in garages and things, uh, and in light of its lack of towing, you know, towing problems. But uh, the F-150, uh, which still has the top sales, your uh, Chevy Silverado, second largest selling vehicle, not truck, vehicle in the United States, the Ram, the third best selling vehicle in the United States, none of them meet the standards. In fact, uh, five of the top 10 sellers were pickup trucks. Two were large SUVs. None will each meet Biden standards. And yet the public says, we don't want you to force us to give up our cars. That same poll said less than 60, uh, only 40% of, uh, of Americans were looking at electric, would be looking at electric cars in the future. And yet Biden says, no, 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 that's your only choice. So they say, give some subsidies. I, I don't agree with that, but they say, give some subsidies to electric vehicles, but don't force gasoline powered cars off the road. Biden's just not listening. He doesn't care, but the elites don't care. So, you know, I used, I have owned electric cars in my lifetime um, and I don't own one anymore, mainly because the promise and the practicality don't match. The bottom line is, is that no matter what the promise is, that never lived up to it, whether it was range, whether it was cold weather operation. I mean, when cold weather, you have to take and make a choice on your electric vehicle in some weather situations. Am I going to go for range and power or am I going to have the cabin heated? You can't have both in some situations with some electric cars. And they haven't gotten that much better, although I did see recently this week that Tesla is promising a, um, a new a warranty of 200,000 miles and a minimum of 12% reduction in the efficiency of the battery. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But through the last year, I believe Tesla, and guys correct me if I'm wrong about this, Tesla's dropped their price on these cars by about six different times because they're having trouble selling them, right? Yeah. And, you know, an interesting thing, I don't know if anybody besides me watched uh, uh, PBS this week, their news hour, but they didn't, it, it wasn't considered a takedown. They weren't trying to take down electric vehicles, but they wanted to look at the problems with charging, right? And so uh, Rivian, uh, electric truck manufacturer that's having a lot of financial difficulties, um, they provided uh, a PBS guy a vehicle to drive. And he wanted to go on a little over a 500 mile trip in California to see how it worked. And uh, the 500 mile trip, a trip that I can do in a day, a half a day, uh, maybe not half a day, but, but certainly in a day. Cause I do, I've done it many times uh, about eight hours. Um, he, he had to take over two days. And the reason was, in part, many of the charging stations that he found weren't fast charging stations. 
other stations that he found um, were fast charging stations, but their credit card reader didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so he's there, he's plugged it in and nothing's happening. And he keeps putting it in. Just, sorry, try another. Sorry, try another. Uh, he couldn't get the charge. So he had to go, you know, it's like, I'm running out. What am I going to do? So he yeah. ended up staying overnight, getting charged overnight uh, to go 500 miles. Uh, each charge, when he filled up, he, he did find one fast um, charger that worked. It, so it took him 90 minutes to, to fully charge. That's fa uh, that's a fast charger. That's a really, really slow gasoline stop for me. Uh, that's that's having a meal. Um, but he, so at, the, at a fast charger, it took him 90 minutes. And when he came out, Filling up his tank cost him $56. So it wasn't much cheaper than gasoline. And it ended up only taking him 30% of the way that it said it would when he started out. It, it yeah. starts out, it shows you how many miles you can travel. And then you just start dropping. It's like, uh, right. you have 30 more miles. And it's like, whoa, I got to find another charger already. It was crazy. Yeah, you know, I'll point out that you can have credit card problems at a gas station too. And, and we've all had those, right? We've gone to the reader and it won't work. But the thing about a gas station is you can go down the street to another one. You know, you've got a bunch of choices with an electric charging or fast charging, your choices are limited. And so you're kind of uh, SOL really, if your credit card won't read. Or you can right. just go well, inside or you can just go inside. I've, I've had problems with readers and I went inside and handed them my card and they charge it and I go out and fill up. Yep. Well, and EVs, right. EVs are EVs seem to be pretty much fine if you have like short commutes. Um, you know, you go to home and to the office, and that's pretty much it. But I'm a long haul driver for like road trips and stuff. Uh, my family regularly takes multiple day road trips. We used to go um, kind of follow 66 from Chicago to California a couple times um, every couple of years. Uh, when I was a kid and that was really fun. Um, I can't, man, if it took longer than those four days though, it wouldn't be worth it. And you have to wonder if that's the point as to why they're pushing it. And we've talked about this before several times that the point might be to get people to travel less in general. Um, and the cost prohib um, prohibitions there are, you know, forcing people onto public transportation, uh, more people are going to keep older cars that don't have as good emission standards as they could because of this. Um, you know, I would, if an electric car really was better for me and for my purposes, for hauling stuff, for going cold places, you know, if it really was that much better, then I wouldn't have a problem with buying one. Uh, but it's not. And I, you know, if it was su the superior technology for my purposes, then I wouldn't have a problem with it. But the fact that it's being mandated, despite the fact that it doesn't work for everyone, is completely absurd. It's tyrannical. Um, I see in our comments we have some people who are pretty pro EV, but it doesn't it doesn't make it right to force people to buy a product just right. because it's some kind of a I don't know. Mo virtue moderate signaling. virtue signal yeah <laughs> yeah so we've we were almost out of time here we got about five minutes left or so i want to get to some of the questions that have been posed by our viewers and readers um so let's see what we've got here as far as questions go and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them um i know we've got some saved <laughs> how do you get a polo <laughs> shirt like anthony's well um you know that would be a question for Jim Lakely because he's in charge of the polo shirts for Heartland. But I'm sure if you guys wanted to get one, something could be worked out. So yeah, we, may, are, we may have someone at the office that you can order that you can get one from. All right. Cool. How oh, are EV quick. batteries? Go ahead. Sorry, that just reminded me. That question just reminded me. Uh, real quick, uh, one of the other barriers to me buying EVs is the overwhelming reliance on slave labor. Um, yep. all technology is made with a certain amount of slave labor period. It, I mean, if you have a cell phone, there's probably some slave labor, some at some point in the, uh, manufacturing line, but it is way worse for almost all of these green technologies and, uh, not a fan of that. 
right? We covered that a few weeks ago in climate yeah. imperialism, where we were showing all those poor kids doing cobalt mining. Ugh, just awful. All right, so how are EVs, batteries disposed of or recycled? Well, first of all, I want to say that the early EVs that use lead-acid batteries just go into the normal recycling chain that we already have in place that has been successful for decades. Lead is one of the most recycled, if not the most recycled, heavy metal on the planet. It's been effectively recycled and reused for decades, and so there's no problem with that. But lithium is a whole nother ball game. Recycling it isn't as easy as lead. And opening up a lead acid battery, I mean, it's pretty simple. You drain the battery from the drain the battery acid. You flush it with water. You pop open the case. You pull the lead out and you put it into the uh, the recycle bin for the lead, and then you take the plastics and put it elsewhere. Then they run the re the lead through processing. With lithium, you can't do that. If you pop open a lithium battery, what do you get? A fire. Special handling is required. So I don't know how they're going to do all that. I mean, yeah, I'm well, sure somebody's well, got. Right now, they're not. That's the answer. Right now, they're piling up everywhere because they haven't figured out how to handle them uh, effectively. You've got uh, the the problem of popping them open and causing a fire. You've got the problem of separating out because it's not just lithium in there. It's, it's other chemicals. And, and they have had to, because of the way they've had to engineer, engineer the battery packs that, you know, to keep things separated and things, it's, it's a much more difficult process. And they haven't figured it out yet. This, you know, this is now to be fair. Uh, almost every technology was brought to the market before they figured out how to how to dispose of end of life stuff. But right now they're just piling up right. or or they never reach to pile up stage because they burn. So. Uh, <laughs> All right. So we have a question here from Luke Starkenberg. Why do we want to save coal? I don't understand why you think coal is worth saving. Well, coal has been the baseload energy for the planet for decades, and it continues to be so today. So. You really want to dispose of your base load of electricity? That's it's not I'm the it, it's not the largest source anymore. It hasn't been for uh, five or ten oh, years okay. now because natural gas has been going in. But the point is, <laughs> coal plants have been regulated. Their emissions are low. They are not causing dangerous air pollutant. And unlike wind, solar, and battery backup, they're reliable. Coal can run. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When you take them offline, you back them up with a, a diesel or a uh, oil burner. You fix them and you put them back online. They provide power 24 hours a day. Not when the sun is shining and convenient. Not when the wind is blowing. And uh, you can store the fuel, lots of it, for many days on site. So if you have problems with the, uh, um, if the ice comes, and freezes your turbines and covers your solar panels and locks up gas facilities. They only have a, a couple of days gas on online. You can have months of coal and keep those power plants running. Uh, in the end, the only reason to force coal off is because you're worried about CO2. And well, I'm not that worried about CO2. Right. Right. Okay. So we've got some more questions here. Let's go through them quickly uh, and see what we've got here in our potpourri of questions. What of methane capture, uh, i.e. in organic landfills, methane can be used fueling turbofan jet engine coupled to an electric generator, co-generation, I helped design one. Well, We, we kind of covered this a bit earlier. Yeah, we did. But basically, methane capture is well-established, well in progress, useful and effective. Um, and we should do more of it, in my opinion. All right, next question. What cheaper forms of electricity with wind and solar... Electricity prices are projected to plummet. <laughs> Where did you get that idea that electricity prices are going to plummet with wind and solar? So far, historically, all they've gone is essentially straight up. I was about to say, yeah, all you've got to do, all you've got to do is not listen to the PR where they say, oh, solar's cheaper than, wind is cheaper than. Look at the places that have implemented wind and solar as a larger percentage of their grid versus those that it kept to coal or natural gas, and you'll see prices are rising faster in those states. How can something yeah. that's cheaper cause your price to rise faster? It, yeah. it doesn't I, It doesn't pass the laugh test. I would say to Luke, stop reading the New York Times and the Washington Post and start looking at the data. All right, 
Just read a 2000, I just read a 2007 paper by Beck on CO2. Okay, let me just say, I'm not even going to talk about this. The, the paper by Beck, in my opinion, is garbage. It, it is badly designed, badly measured, and it's just not even worth discussing. Next question. Sorry, that's the way I feel about it. I've studied it. I looked at it. Just not there. Um, anyway, so what else do we have for questions? Anything good? Don't they use CO2 sometimes in packaging to keep things fresh? Or is that nitrogen? Well, that's mostly nitrogen. nitrogen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, um, I think that pretty well does it for our question today. We filled up a whole hour. And uh, we had a great discussion here about all the different topics and great questions. So I want to say thank you for joining us. And I want you to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and uh, help, us be, um, help us be successful on YouTube. And, of course, visit climaterealism.com for our weekly trouncing of the media where you'll get facts instead of rhetoric. Real, honest-to-goodness facts at climaterealism.com and also at climateataglance.com. That also is just loaded, chock full of facts. And coming up, not too far from now, energy at a glance, something Linnea has been working on. We'll talk about that in a future episode. All right, for Linnea and Sterling, I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for the Heartland Institute for Environment and Climate, wishing you a good day and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.